I'm going to be talking about today um, is not calculating the guilt because DNA can't do that, but I'm calculating statistics to give weight to DNA matches that I can make with DNA testing. Um, this is not going to be a tutorial or how-to, um, but I, I just want to familiarize you with, it's a fairly complex topic, and um, show you how you, it might unexpectedly relate to open source software. Um, the police department I work for doesn't know I'm here. Um, my boss does, but um, also all photos in this are my own or otherwise cited, and they're all available for non-commercial use. And um, I'm going to be talking about science and math. And these slides are fairly dense. They will be available later on slideshare.net. And if you, it, it's a lot of information. So if you have any, like if you're totally lost, raise your hand, shout out. But if you have a longer question, save it to the end, and hopefully we can talk about it. I'm going to explain what forensic DNA is. You need no prior knowledge of that. Give you some examples of the profiles I obtain, the good ones, the bad ones, and the ugly, ugly ones. And then where the open or not software comes into play is using it to calculate statistics to give weight to these forensic DNA mixtures. This is the county that I work for. It's called Anne Arundel County. It's in Maryland. Um, the little uh, diamond shaped box just above it is Baltimore City, Baltimore a uh, resident, born and bred. And just to the west of it, that little cutout is Washington, DC. So that's where we're located, population of about 500,000 citizens. And um, although I'm not speaking in any official cap capacity, I've worked in various forensic labs for about 16 years now, so I have opinions. <laughs> They're actually expert opinions. I've been qualified to voice my opinion in courts of law. So here's the science part. You have, in nearly every cell of your body, a complete copy of your genome that is all 23 pairs of your chromosomes. All your chromosomes are paired. You get one from a biological mother and one from your biological father. This is a huge amount of information. This is over 3 billion units of information. Those units are the A's, T's, C's, and G's that link together and make this little twisty ladder of your DNA. What surprises a lot of people is that only about 2% of your DNA are actually genes. The genes are the recipes that give the instructions for making the proteins that make your various tissues, that make the proteins and enzymes you need to function. Um, really, a, a rather small percentage is actually genes. About a third of it is regulation of those genes so that your heart is not making proteins that skin cells only need, and your skin's not making proteins that only liver cells need. About 50% of your DNA is, actually has no known function. Maybe it has a function that we haven't figured out yet, but it's highly repetitive. It'll be the same few letters, the A's, T's, C's, and G's, it'll be the same few letters repeated over and over again. A-A-T-G, A-A-T-G, A-A-T-G. And um, we're not sure why, but we use this for forensics. The acronym for that repetitive bit is STR. It's short, A-A-T-G, tandem, meaning right after each other, repeat. So here's an example of uh, A-A-T-G, A-A-T-G repeated seven times, and we call that a seven allele because it's repeated seven times. Here we have A-A-T-G, A-A-T-G repeated uh, nine times, and then suddenly it just says AAT, and the G drops off. So it's really nine and three quarters repeat, which we infuriatingly abbreviate to 9.3. <laughs> so if it chopped off after the AA, and it was only nine and a half repeats, we would call it 9.2. I don't know why. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it, it's, this is what happens when science and the law collide. You get insane things. Um, so you can have complete repeats or partial repeats. And everyone has two copies of each piece of DNA we're looking at. These pieces of DNA are called loci. And you have two copies because you have two copies of every chromosome. Um, you may have two copies that are the exact same length because coincidentally, the piece you got from your biological mother and the piece from your biological father happen to be the same length. 
or uh, you'll have two different repeats. So your DNA type could be a 7-7 seven, seven, or a 7 and a 9.3. Does that kind of make sense? I'm going to show some different representations. For example, this is an electropharogram. This is the actual data I see in the laboratory. So when I'm reading the actual raw data output at this little piece of DNA, which is called Tho1 for reasons, I see a peak that is seven units long, and I see a peak that is nine and three quarters units long. So this person, who was me, is a type 7, 9.3 at this location. So I don't actually care what the letters are that make up the repeats. I just care how long the pieces are. So most of your DNA is extremely similar to everybody else on the planet. 99.9% .9 of your DNA is the same as every other human, um, which is reassuring. Um, and we should remember that often. But on the other hand, it's like not useful for forensically identifying unique individuals. I'm not going to look at the parts of DNA that are the same amongst everyone in the planet. That's not helpful. Fortunately, if 1% is different, that still leaves me with about 3 million bits of DNA that are different. So that's where I'm looking. Now, your genes are highly conserved. What that means is generation uh, per generation, as each of your cells divide, it better copy the information correctly and not throw in some crazy mutations, or you'll probably end up with some sort of genetic problem that will lead to health conditions, and you probably won't pass your genes on to the next generation. That's what highly conserved means. Fortunately, these repeated sections have no known function. So when they mutate and they get different, it has no effect. So it gets passed on to the next generation. So that's really useful for us. We're looking at the bits of DNA that are different, not the bits that are the same. This is what a complete forensic DNA profile looks like. This is me. Um, I will be referring in this talk to um, the X and Y chromosome and using the words male and female strictly in a genetic genotype fashion, not um, as in um, an actual gender expression fashion. So um, it's, the font's very hard to see from my data output. But right here, I have um, this one label. It says X. This shows that I have two copies of the X chromosome as opposed to one copy of an X chromosome and one copy of a Y chromosome. And then there's 22 of those STRs I talked about, 22 bits underneath these green bars where I can figure out how long my pieces are. So this pattern of the length of the pieces, 15, 16, all those numbers, that's a unique barcode for me. Um, there's one more section that I won't mention much. This is over here where it gives me a red because it's saying, hello, you have no DNA here. That's looking at an STR that's only found on the Y chromosome. And since I don't have a Y chromosome, there's nothing there. So I'll be referring to the 22 pieces of DNA. That's these guys, one piece, two piece, three piece, four piece, five piece. Your forensic DNA profile, um, because they aren't genes, they don't give you any um, information about the person's physical appearance, their phenotype. Because they aren't genes, I can't determine anything like height, um, race, hair color, anything like that. Not that hair color is really represented by genes. Um, so I'm looking at um, these junk pieces of DNA. So like, uh, just like a barcode, on the back of a book, it's not useful unless you compare it to a database of barcodes. So if I just look at a UPC on the back of a book, I can't say which book this is until I compare it to UPCs in my book database. So with forensic, DNAs, with forensic DNA, I get a profile. It's not really telling me any information until I also get the DNA profiles of victims, suspects, witnesses, exclusion samples, anybody involved in the case. And then I can compare them and say, yep, matches, nope, ruled out. So I don't get DNA profiles. I get all kinds of stuff in the laboratory. This wordle represents um, the past two years worth of evidence items that I've received in my lab where the bigger the word is, the more times I received that type of evidence. This doesn't include blood stains or semen stains. 
Um, this is just um, things that are known like for touch DNA um, or like, like a glass that I've just drunk out of. So glasses, cups, bottles would be in the beverages category. Um, I have two categories for vehicle swabs. There's vehicle steering wheels and vehicles everything else. Um, I get a lot of tools, like uh, uh, large um, screwdrivers, crowbars, things that you would use to break into a place that you do not have a key for. So I received this evidence, and I, one item at a time, bleach down a surface, put on my lab coat gloves, and um, I look at this item of evidence, and then I either use a swab to pick up any cells that are on it, or if it's something that has, say, a piece of clothing with a blood stain, I'll just cut out a small piece of the fabric, about five millimeters by five millimeters. The next step is to purify the DNA, because the DNA's got membranes and proteins and like literal dirt and other junk that I don't want. I wash all that way until I have pure DNA. Then there's a step called quantitation. Because samples can vary from the super, super duper strong, like a blood stain, to the super duper weak, like a, a window that somebody pressed their hand against and left three cells on as they were leaving a crime scene. The next step is that I amplify the DNA. Amplification, it uses this technique called um, polymerase chain reaction, PCR. This is like a chemical photocopier. What we do is we hijack the cell's own ability to duplicate its genes. So you've got that twisty double strand of DNA. I heat it up in here and I unzip it so now you have a single strand and a single strand. I grab um, the enzyme that normally copies DNA and I make it take each one of those sides and make two complete strands out of one complete strand. Repeat again, two becomes four, four becomes eight, 16, 32. Exponentially, over about an hour and a half, I end up with about a million copies of whatever was there to begin with. So it's a chemical photocopier like a photocopier or a computer, garbage in, garbage out. If you put a blank piece of paper on a photocopier and you make a 1,000 copies, you get blank. So if there's no DNA in the tube, the enzyme is just chilling out like with nothing to do. If it's a crappy photocopy, many generations can't read it, it makes lousy copies. So if the DNA is broken down, the enzyme's like, I can copy a little bit of that, but the rest of it's gibberish, I can't copy it. So it takes whatever DNA is there, makes copies of it, and it tags it with a little fluorescent dye, and then I put it on this really expensive instrument. This is called capillary electrophoresis. So, here we've got a, a negatively charged anode. We've got a positively charged anode over here. And these things that look like wires are actually thin, thin little tubes. The DNA travels from the one electrical charge to the other electrical charge, like completing a circuit. And the little pieces fly through faster than the big pieces. And that's how I separate the DNA. So to recap, this is the type of evidence I receive. This is what actually works. So when I made this wordle, I was like, I went over to the evidence collection unit. I was like, hey guys, this is what actually works. They're like, yeah, we totally know. But when we're at the crime scene and the detective is like, pick up that stupid stuff, we kind of have to pick up that stupid stuff. <laughs> Which is a process error um, that is um, possibly above my pay grade. So this is what actually works. Um, most people hate cigarettes. I love cigarettes. <laughs> people litter like crazy. Cigarette butts, water bottles. Everyone's got a water bottle, a cigarette butt. They throw it around. Um, they work great for DNA testing. Um, clothing works great. Hats work great. How often do you wash your hat? Anybody have a hat and is going to go wash their hat when they go home? <laughs> Gloves. Gloves are great because, oh yeah, wash that hat, Mark. Gloves are great because like we have this thing where we're like, we don't catch smart criminals. Like, so like people will wear gloves because they don't want to leave fingerprints behind. So single use latex or nitrile gloves. Then they'll take them off and leave them there. <laughs> the crime scene. And it's lovely. I get a great DNA profile. I once got off of a piece of latex. It was like an inch square, I swear to God. 
I swabbed one side, and I got the person wearing the glove, and I swabbed the other side, and I got a full profile of the elderly man that got beaten. It was amazing. However, I had to test like 50 crappy gloves before I get one beautiful glove, but that's what they pay me for. OK. Actually, let's back up. That is the end of the science. <laughs> if you're ever in Baltimore, give me a call. You can take a tour of the lab. It'll be great. Now we're going on to the mathy portion. But I'm not a mathematician or a statistician, so I'm just going to speak in high-level terms about the math that I do. No formulas. OK. So I get a beautiful sparkling DNA profile off of a blood stain. I test the victim of the assault case, and I know his DNA profile, and they're a complete match. No problem. Beautiful. Lovely. That like never happens. It does happen. It happens about 10 or 15 percent of the time. The rest of the time, I get mixtures. So you can think of it like a clean fingerprint on a beautiful glass surface versus a door handle that everybody who goes in and out of the 7-Eleven all touched on the way in and out. So I get fragmented bits of DNA profiles layered over top of each other, and I don't know which bits go with which person. Um, even in the prettiest of mixtures, I can't make an absolute statement, it is this person, it is not this person. So I need to give a statistic. It is irresponsible and unethical for me to walk into a courtroom and say, I got a mixture, it's at least three people, I can't rule out the defendant. Ta-da! Bye. Nice seeing y'all. Because going into a courtroom and saying, hey, the DNA, this person is included, like juries hear that and they're like, oh, totally guilty, 100%. That's irresponsible. I can't, that's way overstating what I can do. And the prosecutor will take that and run with that and exaggerate that in a way that would be a miscarriage of justice. So any time that I say someone is included, cannot be ruled out, I have to give a statistical weight. I can say, oh, hey, cat can't be ruled out of this mixture of DNA on the doorknob of this classroom. However, about one in a 1,000 people can't be ruled out if I just pick the 1,000 people at random. So hey, there's 50,000, 500,000 people in this county. So that's not really definitive. Versus me saying, hey, you know what? Actually, that mixture, um, it's only about one in a quadrillion people who could fit into that mixture. And hey, cat fits in. And hey, there's only 7 billion people on the planet. And they didn't all have access to that doorknob. Totally different statement. Totally different statement. So any quantitative statement needs a qualitative statement. This is an example of a mixture. How do I know this is a mixture? OK, so piece of DNA, piece of DNA, piece of DNA, piece of DNA. You can only have one, one person can only be responsible for a maximum of two of those peaks because you've got one bit from your father, one bit from your mother. So here at this little bit of DNA, hey, two peaks, OK, cool. Here at this bit of DNA, one, two, three, four peaks. Whoa, ho, ho, need to have at least two people in this mixture. I also know that this is a mixture because I made this mixture for me and my coworker, Bob. Um, <laughs> before I put anything into production, like we upgraded um, the magical box of chemicals that lets us get these DNA profiles. We went from one version to another version, so I had to do a four-month study where I ran it through its paces, like super-duper production-level testing to try to break it, to learn where the limits were. I have to run it through its paces because I need to be confident in what this tool can do, do, and I need to know what it can't do. So I ran bunches of data. I made all kinds of mixtures of me and Bob and other coworkers. This is one part um, Bob and two parts me. And this is the second half because there's four guys. All right, everything's, this is lovely, trust me. Trust me, this is lovely. Um, this, these, you can't see this axis. 2,000, 4,000, these peaks are nice and tall. They're in the thousands. My limit of detection is 70 units tall. So these are plenty tall, beautiful. I've got lots of data. It's cool. This, when this happens, I can do a calculation called a likelihood ratio. OK. A likelihood ratio compares two probabilities of the same event under two hypotheses. Hypotheses. So the event is I got this mixture. 
the hypothesis from the prosecution is this is a mixture of Sarah, the victim, and Bob, the suspect. The defense's hypothesis is, yes, yeah, Sarah is here. We know Sarah was the victim of the crime, and that really sucks for her. But this is a mixture of Sarah and somebody not Bob, somebody else, whose DNA happens to be pretty similar to Bob. So this is a zoom in of this big, big chart over here. OK, zoom in. One little bit of DNA. I have a piece that's five repeats long, a piece that's seven repeats long, a nine, and a 13. OK. I know that I am a seven and a nine. Great. Where did the five and 13 come from? How rare are those alleles in the population? How common are they? Well, fortunately, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the federal agency that keeps the atomic clock and keeps all the clocks working, um, they also determine like what exactly a gallon is. So when you're pumping a gallon of gas, they make sure it's actually really a gallon. They do a lot of um, DNA testing for us as well. And they took a database of a few thousand people, and they determined how frequently that five occurs in the population of unrelated people. How frequently does the 13 occur? And that data is open data and available to anyone who wants to use it. So at this one little bit of DNA where I've got the 5, 7, 9, 13, I can compare the hypothesis that this is me and Bob versus me and a random person from the population. And when I do that math, I come up with a number 360. It is 360 more times likely that this evidence is the result of me and Bob mixing our DNA together versus me and a person I plucked at random from the population. So it's more likely than not that this is a mixture of me and Bob. Now, that's one locus. Like I said, we get like 22 of these guys. So it's like rolling the die 22 times. OK, well, you know, you've got like a 5% chance. You've got to roll it again. It's another 5% chance. But 5 times 5, suddenly it becomes much rarer when you roll that die um, 22 times. So when I compare the whole DNA profile and I calculate the likelihood ratio, I get a ginormous number of 160 sextillion. That's with 23 zeros. <laughs> so when you have beautiful data, it's really informative. That's not a shock. When you have beautiful data, you can say to a high degree of certainty that um, you can link a person with a DNA profile. However, the world is a dirty place. Um, I find that DNA, forensic DNA analysts tend to go one way or the other. Either they become like hyper germaphobes and they clean everything, or they figure that at, like, at least it's not a used condom, so it can't be that dirty. Um, <laughs> like you pick up a tissue that like someone in your family used, you're like, whatever. Um, this is the same mixture. Um, actually, it's a different mixture. I take it back. This is a mixture of at least two people, but like, Hey, at this part, I, there's like no numbers here whatsoever. I didn't get any DNA at all at that piece of DNA, at that section of the DNA profile. They're just, it was broken down DNA. I didn't get it. Or there wasn't enough cells there to get the profile. We call that dropout. Look at this little bit of DNA. Like, there totally looks like there's four peaks there, but you're only seeing one number because only one peak is above my threshold. So the other three dropped out. I've got no data. I can't use that because it's not above my threshold. This is the other half of the profile. OK, but this is not bad. This is bad. This is a dirty profile. This is from a homicide that I'm testing. Well, I tested it last week, and the detective thinks I'm writing the report this week, but I'll actually write it on Monday. <laughs> um, this is from a seatbelt in a vehicle that's related to a homicide. Like, look down here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten alleles. One person can give two alleles. Ten divided by two, five. At least five people's DNA commingled. This is useless. This is why I don't like seat belts, and I don't test them unless it's a homicide, and they're like, please test everything, because a miracle will happen, and I'll get something beautiful. Not this time. Lots of dropout. Not reliable. I only have partial data. OK. DNA is messy. 
um, courts, courts are messy, justice system's messy. I, have to, I can't ever say anything 100% yes or 0% chance whatsoever. Science wants to, the law wants you to say yes or no, and science says, well, maybe, if you gave me this situation, maybe. I had to be able to testify to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. It's the weaseliest of phrases. It's encoded in our law. I have to testify to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. My testing procedure is so sensitive that in my studies, I've gotten full DNA profiles off of like five skin cells. That's crazy stupid. Like, DNA analysts have gone to the companies and been like, stop making it so sensitive. What the hell does five cells mean in the greater scheme of things? Like, I'm wearing a nice clean latex glove and I shake Kat's hand. Hey, hey, I picked up five cells. Hey, you stole that. <laughs> I just put your DNA on there. Woo! Like, so what does five cells mean? Five cells doesn't mean anything legally. So if I have a broken down profile, I need to tell, say to the jury, this doesn't count for much. Our classic statistical tools, the likelihood ratio I just showed you, can't handle dropout. It's an all or nothing, all or nothing scheme. So same mixture of me and Robert that I just showed you, one to two. Hey, same mixture, except I diluted it further, so now it's one part Robert and nine parts me. My DNA is starting to drown his DNA out. His peaks, instead of being almost as tall as my peaks, are now short little stubby guys. I'm also taller than Robert in real life, but that doesn't <laughs> mean anything. OK, exact same profile of me and Robert. Hey, this is a peak that's eight units tall. This is a peak that's 11 units tall. Robert has a peak that's nine units long. It's not showing up here. It's not present. I've lost data because he's so weak in the sample. I'm not getting his full DNA profile. Hey, this is great because I know Robert is in here because I totally put him in here. What happens when this is evidence? 22 loci. It's a perfect match except for one bit. I, I don't, what do I do with that? I could say, well, the suspect is here except for that one bit, so it's probably totally him. He's guilty. That's horrendously biased. I can't interpret the significance of the evidence based on whether or not suspects fit in or not. Different suspect, different evidence. Woo, very bad. Or I could say, look, there's dropout. Can't do anything with it. I'm just going to ignore this DNA profile and hope for a better profile next time. That doesn't work. Because, hey, maybe there's co-defendants. One is named Bob, and one is named Joe. Joe's defense attorney would really like me to go ahead and say this DNA matches Bob, because that's exculpatory. You know, being super conservative and throwing out data, it, at first it seems we're doing the conservative thing and erring on the side of benefiting the defendant. It's not always actually true. It depends on your point of view. So, OK. All right. So. If you've got two people, each person can give at least one up to two peaks. Any place where I have big peaks and two little peaks, I know I have all the data. OK? So let me restate that. The minor contributor, the dude in this sample, can have at most two little peaks. If I'm seeing both little peaks, they're both there. If I'm seeing one little peak, is it because he only has one little peak or because one dropped out. So I, I can't say for certain. So let me only use the data where I have two little baby peaks. This is currently what I do. I say, OK, where, based on the assumption of two contributors, which I clearly state in my report, which loci do I have complete information? Four out of 22. I literally throw out 80% of my data and say, sorry. And then I calculate a likelihood bit ratio based on to partial data. My number went from like a sextillion to 1.4 million. Understating is just as bad as overstating. I actually said this a little early. We think we're being conservative by only using the strongest bits of information, but you're throwing out even weak information helps. And it could be the, the key exculpatory bit of DNA that 
rules somebody out and sets them free and proves that they did not, were not involved in this crime. So we need a better model. The model's broken. We need a better model. The name for this is probabilistic genotyping. These are just emerging. This is, well, this is not cutting edge to actual math people who've been using this for ages. But for, for the, the courts, which move slowly and glacially, except the Supreme Court had good rules. The courts move slowly and glacially, so we haven't really adopted this in the legal setting. OK. Probabilistic genotyping. These are better statistical models. Two types, semi-continuous and continuous models. OK, semi-continuous models consider the probability of dropout. OK, so yay, I've got my data. I've got a big old 20 peak. I've got a little 22 peak. What are the odds that there's a baby peak I'm missing? I can determine that before I test the evidence. I can do validation studies, and I can run a bunch of weak samples, and I can say, like, 2% of the time, a bit of DNA drops out. So factor that into all my calculations. 2% of the time, the, the, the data drops out. So you know, if it's not there, there's a slim but not zero chance that I'm just missing some data. It's not the, the best mathematical model, but it's better. Even better, it's open source. Um, this is Lab Retriever. Um, Lab Retriever is written by some professors um, at UC Berkeley, UCLA, and California State University. It's the best of the semi-continuous models available. Um, it was originally written in R, and it was rewritten in C++, probably for reasons that the person who rewrote it liked C++. Um, <laughs> that's all I know about it, because I don't code. So um, it's on GitHub. Download it. It's super easy to use because I realized on Friday I better download it and try it out and write this talk. Um, I like it. Um, the hardest part was I had had months and months of validation data, so I had to crunch it to figure out my dropout possibility. That was the only hard part, was not the software, but gathering the data for the input. OK. I plug in magical numbers that you can't read. Um, Here's, a, here's the DNA profile, the one that I mixture of me and Robert that was incomplete. I tell it, look, this is the victim. This is me. I am totally in this mixture. It was a swab from my own skin. I know I'm in this mixture. But what about Bob? Do you think Bob could fit into this mixture? Clickety click. Um, and it does, at each locus, it does the likelihood ratio, factoring in the fudge factor with the dropout. It does it for three different statistical groups of population groups, African American, Caucasian, and Hispanic populations that um, NIST has data for, and that multiplies them together and gives you a final result. So the final result is, remember back before, we had a gigundo number. Then when I can only use 18% of the data, we had a smaller number. And now when I plug in the full profile, but I say there could be some missing stuff. Um, now I have a in between -y number of 730 qu quintillion. That doesn't sound like an in between -y number, but for DNA, that's an in between -y number. Um, this, is, this example with the dropout was still a pretty good profile. In, in real life, this number is going to be much lower, like millions, billions ish. Um, this is so much better. So much better. I have not unconsciously or consciously apply any bias to using bits and pieces of the mixture. I just threw the whole mixture in there and said, hey, software program. No, you have to trust your software program. I have to validate this program upside down and sideways and everything so I can go into court and say, software is doing what I think it's doing. But I'm not putting my spin on the mixture. I can give the same DNA profile to one of my coworkers. I could give it to somebody else in another lab. And they won't have different rules for how to handle it. They should get the same number. The defense can take my profiles, which they are legally entitled to under a discovery motion. They can give it to any private lab that they want to hire. And they can say, you crunch it. Make sure you get the same number. That's good. All right, I mentioned there's two different types of probabilistic genotyping models. There's the semi-continuous and there's the continuous. Continuous models are better because they're more sophisticated. It uses a Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. I'm not explaining what that is. 
the internet has many explanations for that, but I'm not the statistician best equipped to explain that. Um, it's a mathematical model. You're using, you're predicting the probability that an event will occur based on information about the prior state of the event. So we know how frequently those DNA alleles occur in the population. So what is the chance that I'd end up with a mixture that looks like the mixture I got from the evidence? Um, I, I use a lot of analogies when I explain things in court. And I was thinking a good explanation of a mathematical simulation is like the tracking a path of a hurricane as it comes up the coast. And is it going to hit you or not? Except I'm not sure if I want to go into court and explain that I'm kind of like a weatherman, because then they're going to be like, you're so totally lying, and I don't trust you. Um, this uses more data. This uses more data. So it independently, it doesn't care about my profile or Bob's profile. It only looks at the evidence, even less bias. It just looks at the evidence. And it says, OK, based on the fact that sometimes things drop out, 40% of the time you've got, um, well, you've definitely got a, a big person here. But 40% of the time, you've got another contributor who is an AC type. And quarter of the time, you've got a person that's a BC type. And 20% of the time, the person's just two Cs. And 15% of the time, it's C and something else you didn't even detect, because I know sometimes dropout happens. This is more complicated. It's not open source. I can't show you an example of it. The best software to do this is a package um, developed by the government DNA labs in New Zealand and South Australia um, called STRMix. Um, this is really hot right now. A lot of the big federal agencies and state agencies have purchased it. I just audited the ATF's lab uh, called Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. They have a DNA lab. Um, it's becoming the standard. However, it's 20 grand. I work for the government. I got to ask for things three years in advance. It's $5,000 a year subsequently um, for updates. Um, I don't have it yet. I want it. Or you could write me one. Um, all right. In all seriousness, I, I really feel very strongly about this. And I hope this comes through, because the justice system is not really open source <laughs> embracing. But it, it's really important to me, because um, and bias and impartiality and transparency, lack of transparency. Like, we've seen what happens when people suddenly are carrying around video cameras and they can record police interactions. Suddenly, a whole different layer of truth comes out when your methods are transparent. I want DNA to be transparent because it's powerful. I want the power to be used for good. Um, because the power can be abused, I don't want to like be like, oh, that's it, no more DNA, bye. Also, I don't have a job. But I don't want that to happen. I don't actually tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I honestly do swear that when I get up on the stand. You tell, tell me, swear under penalty of perjury, tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because they don't let me just stand there and talk for 40 minutes. I can only answer the questions I'm asked. Prosecutor skews it one way. Defense attorney skews it another way. It's an adversarial system. That's how it's set up. I'm always really like, OK, so when I lived in Baltimore city limits, I got called every year for jury duty. And they would like, every year, they'd be like, oh, you work for the police, go home. And I'm like, no, I'm a great juror. Prosecutors lie to me. Defense attorneys lie to me. I don't trust any of them. Police officers lie to me all the time. So it's important to me to be as transparent as possible as a scientist who is supposed to be giving you independent evaluations, even though I work for the police. I want to give you an independent evaluation. So what's the state of forensic DNA, open source, and open data? OK, binary statistics, the simple likelihood ratio, yeah, I can do that with a pencil and paper and a calculator. That's open source. Semi-continuous methods, lab retriever, open source. Continuous methods, no. The frequency databases, the underlying data you, knew, you need to build a mathematical model, that's open source, yay. Interestingly, data analysis, when I was showing you the electropherograms with the peaks, yeah, that's proprietary software. I I'm obliged, according to Maryland state law, that when the defense for, asks for it, I give them my raw data files. Those raw data files are completely useless because they're in a proprietary format. And the defense cannot interpret them unless they buy the software package. <laughs> I don't agree with that. But 
code is, I didn't bring this up, but if you want to start like an argument in a bar amongst some forensics people, talk about CODIS. It's the combined DNA index system. It's the DNA database run by the FBI. So not open source. I don't even know what's going on with it half the time. And I'm a member. I'm a CODIS laboratory. Um, the, FBI, the FBI is so uncooperative that the ATF, which is another federal agency, found it cheaper and more efficient to hire people and build their own DNA lab than to continue begging the FBI to test their cases that involved explosive devices. It's bad. Um, so you can't fix CODIS for me, um, though I'd love it if you did. But um, statistics are hard. If the general population and people who made up juries understood statistics, Vegas wouldn't exist. Um, but I really strongly believe that transparency is the key to credibility. I believe that in police work, even though I'm a civilian, and I believe that in forensics. Um, all scientists, it's drummed into us to document all observations, document all our results, but then I'm magically sticking my numbers into a black box and you're supposed to trust my statistics? That doesn't work for me. I think calculations have to be as open as the data. Thank you very much.